Well, welcome back. Joining us in the studio this week, we're delighted to have returning to the show Miss Nancy Shrum, the Director of Constituent Services. Uh -huh. Nancy, welcome returning back. Returning champion. Returning. <laughs> we love when we have you here. Um, today, we're talking more about Not My Child, an update on, on the program, and you're somewhat more of a program manager for this um, initiative. So let's take it back. When and how did Not My Child start? Well, it goes back two years already. Um, January 25th, 2015, County Executive Steve Hsu did a public health emergency announcement at Anne Arundel Medical Center um, as heroin being a public health emergency for our county, uh, an epidemic. And that was within 60 days of being in office that the county executive brought this forward to the county and our citizens and immediately followed up with the Heroin Action Task Force, which brought all these county agencies together to take a look at their best practices regarding law enforcement health in the area of the opioid and heroin crisis and asked them all to beef it up and um, take other approaches, think out of the box and how we could go about eradicating this horrific thing, um, um, the opioid crisis. And unfortunately, we are now two years later and with all the great efforts by so many people in county government, we are losing people. Um, and it, 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 how do I say it? it unprecedented rates. Do you feel that still though, having the task force, having Not My Child, has at least brought the issue up in terms of brought it to light, um, made people talk about it more? What do you think that the progress has been so far with this underway? Not My Child, um, like some will describe it as a tour, a movement. Um, we go into the community in a school setting, community, clubhouse, you name it, we'll go wherever people are that will have the conversation with us. And it opens up a huge discussion about how does it even begin? How does someone acquire an addiction to, and it leads to death? So that whole conversation takes place with, with the whole goal of educating our citizens, our healthy families of how to avoid this thing called addiction because once you got the addiction, it's either it kills you or you now have something you have to manage for life. And who wants that? Mm -hmm. I and totally understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so you've, you've really lived and breathed this for, for <laughs> two years. I mean, you're the person who is doing the legwork, finding the venues, doing the invites, getting the panelists, all that. And in, in conversations with you, I think you've learned so much about what happens here, and you're really an expert on the subject now. I mean, there's no, you, you came into it knowing very little, and now correct. you're really an expert. That's correct. But the thing that, that, I, that strikes me is the people that you deal with, that you come into contact with, that you wouldn't have normally, and we've come to know them, and they've become, you know, Family. some of their faces are, are recognizable because we've really mm -hmm. tried to get their faces in front of people. Tell us a couple examples of, like, some people that you've met along the way and a little bit about their stories. Well, I can tell you about Melissa, um, who is a beautiful, young, 23, 24-year-old, and her story starts at the age of 11 um, at a family wake. And at the age of 11, she observed um, parents, family, um, for just simply what we would call simply having a cocktail, um, having beverages, and then as a result, feeling good. She, in her little mind as an 11-year-old, she recognized that what they were drinking made them feel good. Mm -hmm. So through other channels, she starts acquiring alcohol at the age of 11. She is the young lady in middle school that invited the other middle schoolers to the unsupervised home um, where other children began to drink. Red Solo cup in the basement. There you go. And, um, and then because of Melissa, um, how she is put together, I call it um, what the drummer that she marches to because we all march to a different drummer. That was the beginning of her then taking on the next from alcohol to marijuana to um, prescription medications. And then it eventually led um, in her last year of college, because her she managed an addiction all the way through um, into college. And as a senior in college is when she hit rock bottom. And we're, I love and her to death. this was heroin? This is, yeah, she mm -hmm. got involved with heroin. And um, I'm 
happy to say that Melissa um, is a healthy young lady today and doing well, but she will tell you she is at meetings every day to stay on track, um, to stay peaceful within herself um, so she doesn't use again. So, um, so Melissa's, are, and, and if she walked through that door, you would think she just walked off the USA soccer team. That is how healthy and vibrant a young lady she is. But she carries the weight now of managing an addiction. Then you have the family. You know, the family that's lost the child um, through a heroin overdose. And, you know, you say they lost a child through a heroin overdose, but prior to the death, that now they have to live with and carry in their heavy heart for the rest of their lives. They had eight to ten years of trying to keep their children alive and it destroys the family. Yeah. It really impacts the family, not just maybe the mom and dad or the mom who's behind this child that's, you know, um, in trouble. It impacts the siblings because mom and dad are all focused on keeping right. this per young person with an addiction alive yeah. and everybody else is kind of le left forgotten. So it impacts the family. Um, last night at Not My Child at Central Middle School, we met a young man that just relapsed Wednesday, but his mother found him in an alley in Baltimore City and brought him back, and by the good fortune of a uh, church in South County, putting the Not My Child in their Sunday bulletin, got them to the event last night. We talked to him last night. He met a circle of people. Now is additional resources for him, and he, was, he walked out a happy person as a result of coming and listening to the conversation last night. Wow. And he even said, he goes, I wish this was available to me when I was a kid. And we hear that a lot from our high school kids when we're in the student assemblies. Where were you in middle school? Because we are using. The kids, when we do the student assemblies, are blatantly honest. And the teen, it scares me. The teenage culture is very accepting of drinking and smoking weed on a regular basis, but what the young people don't know is that that weed isn't bought off, apart from CVS, um, you know, with you know an ingredient that? on the bag. Right. The marijuana is laced with other potent drugs. So the message we give the kids at the student assemblies is this. When you're buying from your dealer, the goal of that dealer is next time give you something stronger because they want you to keep coming back. You're the customer. And um, the kids don't get that until they, you know, they, they, they don't know any better. I mean, really, they just don't know any better. They think they're buying weed. It's going to make them feel and a little. And neither do the parents. And neither do the parents. And, yeah. and you know, it, with all good, it, parents are raising their children in all different family makeups, you know, dynamics, the best of their ability. But this stuff grabs them and it grabs them too late. Parents are not aware of it, that their child has a serious problem until it's a problem. Well, Nancy, we're doing real talk here today about <laughs> this issue because we know that, that you know so much about it. What do you say to, you know, is it frustrating to you, and you just mentioned how you kind of, you've created a community where it's almost like you've added another safety net where people see the siren song of the, the Not My Child logo and they come to one of your presentations and all of a sudden they know all these people they can look to and mm -hmm. can help guide them. Um, but so I want to ask you, when you see the numbers coming in and you see the number of fatal overdoses doubling in the last year, does that feel make it feel like it's not working, that you're not being successful, or do you feel like you are? Well, the goal now, it, yeah, because the numbers have increased, they've doubled, you know, even with the efforts that we've done in the prevention side. The prevention side right now is to prevent new users. This is not going away. I said it last night in my introduction. There's always going to be drugs in our communities. There's always going to be crime as a result of drugs. And there's going to be death. So the way to prevent those three things, no new users. Everybody's got to grasp this. Don't even start. Huh. Don't think that you can start smoking a little bit of weed and it won't grab you. No, you know, you don't know what your genetic makeup is. You don't know if you are predisposed for an addiction. And I also say is, what, you know, and why? And that age is very young, right? You yeah, can you get you know, to them really young. 
if you, this is, let's talk about alcohol. If you start drinking before the age of 15, yeah. you are like t seven to 10 times more likely to become an alcoholic. And it is, this is what's really important, the brain. You start drinking, you start smoking weed, this is all changing the brain. The chemistry, well not the chemistry of the brain, but the makeup of the brain, the development of mm -hmm. the brain, because our brains are not fully developed until the age of 25. Science is there. And, I'll, and I'm gonna jump to this. It's really disappointing our state legislators are thinking about recreational marijuana. I wanna know where are they in the conversation of the opioid crisis? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how are we all talking about solutions funding opioid, the opioid crisis, and then on the, right over here, there's a whole conversation, let's bring in the recreational marijuana. I'm like, yeah, I yeah. don't understand. <laughs> Piggybacking off of Dave's question, as far as numbers go right now, we've also seen a spike in fatalities, and I'm wondering how other drugs such as fentanyl, fentanyl. plays into this. Fentanyl, carfentanyl. Um, fentanyl is a drug that's designed to slow down your heart. So when um, heroin is purchased, the dealers are you know, combining the fentanyl with the heroin, and a person putting this in their body, they want the high. They're not thinking that they're gonna stop their heart from beating, but that's exactly what happens. Last night, Captain Russ Davies from the fire department told us that when they get the 911 calls to, for an overdose, because we are also pushing Narcan. We really want people to think about having Narcan on them to save a life because it will save a life. But um, within three minutes of shooting up with heroin, with fentanyl, your heart stops. If it's present at all? If, if the fentanyl is on... in the heroin. Well, let's yeah. back up a little bit. So fentanyl, my understanding of fentanyl is, is a, it is a, um, a narcotic a, pain pain um, medication, usually for cancer patients, no, no, uh, no. people with it's, serious it's used, surgeries. It's, no, it's, it's used in the process for anesthesiology. Anesthesia, okay. To bring you down for surgery. But it's a very, very potent painkiller and also slows down your heart rate. Well, it's not a painkiller. It, it's, it's, it's designed for the anesthesiologist to put you to sleep. Okay. But it's controlled. Uh huh. But now you have. Someone who's not someone. You know, dealers adding it to the heroin right. in in um a, in a way that it just bang. Why are they doing that? Because it's because it's cheaper well, or because they, it increases the volume they're selling. I Think see. about it. I don't you know I don't know how, it, how it's all put together. I know it's only ten dollars a bag, and that's why when someone acquires this addiction to opioids. You know, they can't get their prescription drugs anymore. They no, no longer now have $80 for a pill for oxycodone or Percocet. So, and because of the desperation, because when someone has this addiction, if they don't keep it up, meaning keep taking the opioids, the, pill, the prescriptions, they get sick. It's mm -hmm. all about not being sick. Yeah. So that's why this continuous use, because um, it's about, the dope stick that you get through the withdrawal process. I remember the the number one thing that stood out to me when um, I, I got an opportunity to interview a, a young addict who he was maybe early 20s and he told me about so we had this alert last week saying there's been a spike in deaths where I guess it was a bad batch of heroin or what have you it was laced with fentanyl and people were were dropping like flies in a short period mm -hmm. of time and I remember him telling me that when, when addicts hear that, they want to know where mm -hmm. the person got that and they, they bet, want right? to get oh, that, mm -hmm. that killed someone mm -hmm. because they want the most powerful oh. uh, version that they can find. So they mm -hmm. go right to the place where people are right. buying it and dying. Right. Well, it's so, so, it's hard to, I know we've had this conversation to understand. Well, I think there, there's a lot going on out there as to why we, are, why we are where we are now with the loss of death. If you think about, there was over 1,000 overdoses in Anne Arundel County in 2016. And of those 1,000, about 125 are gone that our police department and fire department have on record. Their numbers are probably higher, but that's what's on record that we see in our office. Mm -hmm. So I say to myself, okay, is this a result of people that 
were prescribed pain medication for a wisdom tooth, ACL tear, broken arm. Doctor gave them 30, 60, 90 day prescription. And that person really, I mean, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, honestly didn't understand. You know, you take a couple of pills, and you know, and, and actually last night, the young man Tyler is on our panel, he did have an injury. And um, he commented, well, I had the prescription, and I told my dad I really wasn't feeling good. I was, I was in pain. And, dad, and his dad said, well, then take two. Don't just take one, but take two. Mm -hmm. That's where it begins. Because then, for some people, you know, you can take a Percocet, my own experience, when I had children, um, through C-sections. I'll just start by I had C-sections. Wow, um, well, a lot of information prescribed there. Thank you, Nancy. Percocet. <laughs> Percocet. <laughs> prescribed Percocet. It made me sick. I went, ugh. So did want one of them push that away, never touched it again. But and for then, other people, but for other it, it people, flips the it, it could be, it could actually make you feel good. That may, would make you okay, say, right. let me try it again. Yeah. Gateway, exactly. And also too, because it does take away the pain. So I'll tell you what Kim Vote, a parent, said on a panel because she has experienced her her son overdosing and, and near death. Um, pain does not kill. So, right. you know, it's one thing to take one or two pain medications to get you over that, you know, serious pain that you might be feeling initially after surgery, but then immediately go to your ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. And you have endure, to just know. Have the tolerance, endure some pain, because it's better to endure that pain for a little bit than have a lifelong addiction. The pain ain't going to kill you, the medication could. That's correct. So, so I think one thing that comes out of that to me is when you're prescribed an opiate for pain relief when you have some sort of medical issue, know from the very beginning when you start taking that that you gotta be ready to get off it just as fast as you got on it. Don't let it linger. Don't you know take too much at, at for mm -hmm. take the dosage that's on the, the bottle right. and just have it in your mind that just in case I'm gonna make sure I'm on top of things. So when I as soon as I don't have to have this anymore, I'm not doing it because the longer you keep doing it, the more your body's gonna get um, tolerance for it. People, everyone just really needs to be their own advocate when they visit their doctor, and especially when they wanna prescribe you a narcotic to, t to main manage your pain, because um, the doctors admittedly will tell you that they didn't get a lot of training when it came to pain management, but they are prescribing it. I think um, more doctors today are more aware and are more careful about it, the, um, what they're prescribing. But at the same time, you've got to take care of yourself. Exactly. And um, you have to ask good questions when you visit your doctor. But then on the other hand, you have the flip of the switch with um, our families that are drinking and smoking with their children, parenting uh, techniques that I wouldn't um, promote. But there are a lot, lot of adults out there that really think drinking and smoking weed with your children is really okay. Um, it's not. And um, then again, too, young children sometimes experience, you know, demonstrate behavioral issues. You know, they have behavioral problems that really need attention. And um, and if if we could, if the parent, the pediatrician, whoever, it with um, looking out for that child, understands there's a behavioral issue that we need to pay attention to it at the young age so that young child can learn the coping skills of whatever it might be that's causing them to feel the way they feel so they don't go grow up thinking and learning you can self-medicate. I think there's a lot of different, we, we, there's a lot behind why our country is in this, in this has this problem. Um, I was in a meeting yesterday, yesterday morning and learned the numbers that were given to us in the year 2015, over 42,000 people have died in this country as a result of opioid heroin overdose. That is three times the amount of young men and women we lost during the Vietnam War. Oh my goodness. And $42 billion was purchased. Purchased. Dr mm -hmm. People spent $42 billion on drugs for their, uh, um, for their habits, mm -hmm. and all that money, $42 billion, goes to the bad guys. Yeah. Mm. Nancy, thank you so much for coming on the show today, giving us an update as far as um, what's going on with the numbers this year, what we're seeing, what you've been up to with Not My Child.
folks out there should definitely take advantage of this great resource and we appreciate all the hard work that you do. So. Thank well, you. I just want to let me just let say this that the Not My Child team is comprised of a panel of parents, young people in recovery, public safety, healthcare professionals that are all passionate about the awareness that is needed. So I would encourage um, you know your viewers to tune in with us, uh, learn about where we are, invite us to your community. Um, so we can continue the conversation because it's very, it's very important. Absolutely. And also, also, aacounty.org, mm -hmm. go to County Executives Initiatives, the Heroin Action Plan. You can find Nancy's office put together a fantastic resource directory that has all the numbers you need for treatment providers, counseling, all Perfect. that. All right there. And all we kinds will, of information. And we will be at Glen Burnie High School February, February 9th. 9th at seven o'clock for a Not My Child discussion. Very right. good. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in again. Thank you again. We look forward to having you back. We'll be right back with more Week in Review right after this. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>